Welcome to Sakshi TV Special Immigration Talk Show with Attorney Somi Reddy. For today's show, we will be talking about the, uh, you know, uh, uh, all the whatever we are talking about. We were going to be talking about criminal offenses. Uh, but also, uh, please know that Sakshi TV now has five immigration shows every week on Monday with Somi Reddy Law Firm, on Tuesdays with Kaveti, on Wednesdays with Prashanti Reddy in English, on Thursdays with Chand Paratneni, and on Fridays with Banu Nindra. Please tune in to ask your question. If you are an immigration attorney and would like to join our special shows, please email us at usa at sakshi.com or call us at 8667257441. Before we begin the show, please know that the information provided on this show is not legal advice and for general informational purposes only. Sakshi TV or its agents will not be responsible for the use of information. If you need any specific legal advice, you can definitely contact uh, the firm directly. So, Mireti Garo needs no introduction, but if you need consultation, you can definitely log on to their law firm so site, which are available on the website, or you can definitely contact on the numbers shown on the screen. So, without any further delay, let us welcome Mireti Garo onto our show. So, Mireti Garo, how are you, Andy? Welcome back, and I apologizing for getting to this topic. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Um... So, yeah, before we start, just one prediction about uh, myself and our firm. Uh, my name is Santosh Somiridi. I'm the founder of Somiridi Law Group. We are a full service law firm with offices in Virginia, New Jersey, and North Carolina and India. Our core areas of practice include immigration, litigation, corporate, employment, family, and criminal law matters. So we handle a wide range of matters. Uh, various, like, we have different attorneys handling different areas of law. Uh, we are currently licensed in 14 states, uh, wherein we practice all areas of law, and then uh, we practice immigration in all the 50 states. So, yes. <clears throat> uh, without further delay, uh, delay, I think we can get into the topic. Uh, yes. I think we have a wonderful drop topic, which involves <laughs> the effect of criminal conviction on someone's immigration, which is a very yes. important topic. Yes. Uh, so my first question to you, Reddy Garu, is that how is immigration and criminal law related? Um, is it vice versa? Is it reciprocal to each other that, you know, if you get into a criminal law, or if you get into a criminal offense, it is going to be affecting your immigration. What is your take on this? Good. So depending on a person's immigration status, whether he is on an immigrant visa like H1s, L1, B1, F1, or if they are on a green card, right so depending on their current visa status and the crime they are being charged with whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony aggravated felony or maybe say crime involving moral turpitude depending on the charge that they have, they have been the, the uh, charge that is uh, made against them they could have different uh, repercussions some could mean that they will not be allowed to enter into the country or um, apply for adjustment of status um, in some cases, a person could be even uh, deported or removed from the country. Okay, and some of these immigration, uh, like some of these crim uh, criminal cases, could even affect a person's ability to be able to become a U.S. citizen in the future. Right. So, criminal law plays a major uh, has a major effect on someone's immigration status. So yeah. whenever someone gets charged with a crime, right, it is very important that they work with the criminal lawyer because even like whenever a person gets charged with a crime, they typically go for a criminal lawyer, right? So the criminal lawyer by law is required to work with the uh, immigration lawyer whenever the charge is made against an immigrant. Okay. If the criminal lawyer does not do so, the criminal lawyer could be in trouble. Of course, he'll also be in trouble. Of course. Uh, so, uh, Reddy Garu, what kind of different, uh, you know, um, criminal offenses are pretty common for these people who are on immigration visas? Um, uh, you know, I think the most common thing that uh, we've probably seen was shoplifting or a rash or drunk driving. That is something that has been, you know, coming in light. Uh, very recently in California, there was a drunk driving. And unfortunately, a lot of kids lost their life. 
so you see uh, these are the common offenses that uh, let's let's go line by line by line so let's start with the students i think uh, because usually a lot of students watch our shows i think it it can be um, a very informational uh, show for them too so let's start with that what are the common things that you as a lawyer see the most common things that we see uh, like students getting charged with is number one is dui Drink, drink, driving under the influence of alcohol. The second one is um, um, what do you call a rash driving? Like uh, it, it's the, that's a misdemeanor too. Uh, the third one is shoplifting. Fourth one is getting involved in uh, things like prostitution, sexual offenses. So these are the four common things that we come across. Okay. Please note that the moment a person gets charged with one of these crimes, there is a high possibility that your visa could be revoked. Okay, so whether you have been convicted or acquitted with the crime, it does not matter. Okay, once you are charged with a crime uh, like a DUI or any aggravated assault or crime involving moral turpitude, whether it's shoplifting. Uh, or whether a person is getting in, like is involved in like prostitution or the, any other sexual offenses, right? There is a high chance that their visa will be revoked. That means that whatever the visa that they that was issued to them uh, in order to enter into the country would be revoked. That does not mean that the person has to leave the country immediately because all you need is a valid identity code to stay in the country, but you need that visa in order to be able to re-enter into the country. So if a person is charged with any of these kinds, and if you leave the country, I highly recommend that you monitor the email that you used to register for the visa at the consulate, right? To see if your visa has been revoked. Because lately we have been seeing a lot of cases wherein somebody is trying to board the flight and then the uh, immigration authorities stop them, stating that, hey, your visa is no longer valid. Okay, and then when we send an email to the embassy and all, we come to know that hey, the visa has been revoked because they were charged with a crime. Okay, it doesn't matter if the, even if the, child, the case is dismissed, but still, you could the, your visa could be uh, revoked. So that's very important that you pay attention to that one. Second thing, whenever you are charged with a crime, right? Typically, if it's a first time DUI. A, then you may have to go through uh, some psychological evaluation to make sure that, again, it depends upon your alcohol con con uh, concentration also, blood alcohol concentration also. But typically, if it's just one time DUI, then it should not uh, stop you from getting a visa, but you may have to go through some physical evaluation, physician evaluation. Uh, second thing, if a person is charged with crime such as shoplifting, right? So then we look at, we have to look at two things, whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony, right? Misdemeanor is a uh, lesser crime, um, which may not carry more than one year of uh, jail sentence, right? Uh, but it's to, it could still carry some uh, jail sentence. For example, even reckless driving, reckless driving in the state of Virginia is considered as misdemeanor. Right. So a person could actually be put in jail just because they've been charged with reckless driving. Reckless driving could involve like typically whenever a person is driving more than 15 uh, miles per hour over the speed limit, a person could be charged with reckless driving. OK, so even uh, when it comes to uh, the shoplifting cases, right? So uh, whenever a person is charged with the shoplifting, whether it's uh, a misdemeanor offense, but it's a smaller offense, like a petty offense, or uh, it's it, it's a felony, right? Wherein the amount um, uh, uh, the amount involved in the offense is higher, right? It could have an effect on your immigration status. Okay, of course there are certain exceptions, especially there is something called a petty offense exception, wherein if a person is charged with one CIMT and if it is um, if the maximum sentence for that offense does not include more than one year, there are certain exceptions available. Okay, so 
The other thing is when you're charged with a crime, right? When you're charged with a crime, so what happens is even if the judge dismisses a crime, the the charge because you did some community service or you went through some training program, right? It could still be considered as being convicted for immigration purposes. So being connected for criminal purposes is different from being connected for immigration purposes. Okay, so assume that somebody is charged with a felony offense, and the judge, like maybe he did, he went through some uh, training programs, and then they did uh, some community service because of which the judge has suspended the jail sentence. Right? Still, this could have an effect on the immigration. The person could be put into deportation or removal. Different removal. Okay, so it's very important that whenever you are dealing with a criminal offense, right, any offense, uh, so you have to not only look at uh, the, um, uh, the sentencing as per it, it, uh, with the judge, but also you need to look at the, re the repercussion that it would have on your immigration status. Yes. So, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Reddy, my other question to you is, um, what are some other convictions that these H-1B people do? Um, I think one can be their, uh, uh, you know, submitting forged documents. I think that's something mm -hmm. that is pretty common. And maybe lying about their work timings or working extra shifts, um, which is, again, pretty common. But people don't really realize that it's actually a criminal offense that, uh, you know, exceeding their work hours because apparently they do have a work limit happening. So what is something that you deal with and you have dealt with in the past? Yeah. So if, if it's regular, like the regular timesheet, I'm not too much worried about it. But whenever you're signing a document under the penalty of perjury, right? And then if you're lying under the penalty of perjury, that's a problem, right? And that could go against your good moral character also, uh, which uh, could which could affect your chance of getting a green card in future or citizenship application too. Okay, so you have to be very careful because you should never lie to any 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 of the documentation. And the other thing is, if you're lying, if you're providing a falsified document to immigration authorities, then you're already charged with misrepresentation, right? Uh, and uh, for misrepresentation is looked at very seriously. Um, it's um, so a person could be permanently barred from entering into the country just be because they are charged with misrepresentation, especially submitting fraudulent documentation or providing incorrect uh, experience information. Uh, or sometimes people mess up with their birth certificates, especially when filing for adjustment of status applications. They get the birth certificates from some one of the sources which is not verifiable. Right. In those cases, also a person could be charged with misrepresentation, or maybe you are um, at the port of entry. Right. If the officer asks a question and if you lie to the officer, then also you could be charged with misrepresentation. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, Reddy Garu. Um. So, when people are getting convicted, let's say someone, uh, you know, got convicted or got arrested for, you know, stealing or, uh, you know, abusive, uh, you know, uh, abusive behavior outside, uh, because that is not how it works there in USA, of course. <laughs> um, and also there is something called as speed limits and all of it. So. What do they do? Do you have to contact your immigration lawyer or do you have to go seek a criminal lawyer who is, you know, the person to get you out of that hole? And what are some things that these people have to get in their heads before, you know, of course, you shouldn't be committing anything. But unfortunately, if you still do, who are, uh, who should, whom should be the one they should be calling and telling everything? Yeah. So they would need to hire a criminal lawyer as well as an immigration lawyer. Okay, because the criminal lawyer has to uh, represent them in the local court wherever they are charged with. Okay, but the criminal lawyer, before entering into any plea, a pleading or uh, any plea, so they have to consult with an immigration lawyer also. So typically, a person is required to hire both criminal as well as a uh, immigration lawyer. Okay, so luckily, we are in a position because uh, to represent the clients in both on both sides, right? We practice both criminal as well as immigration. So, but only in certain states. So in these states, 
whenever we handle a criminal law matter, we also look at the, in, the issues that they have on the immigration side. Okay, so for example, assume that I have a shoplifting case in uh, Bajir, right? So typically what we can do is like assume that um, there is a jail sentence, right? We can get the jail sentence removed and then, but we would not really agree with that one, with that, ju uh, with that uh, judgment wherein the judge is going to just uh, get rid of the jail sentence, but uh, the person has to go through some training program or do any uh, uh, voluntary work, right? So what we do is we work with the prosecution um, and the court to see how we can negotiate on that term so that it will not affect the person's immigration because that is more important, right? Even if we have to pay a little bit of fine or whatever it takes, we want to make sure it does not affect their immigration. So in a situation like this, what we try to do is we will we will communicate. We will uh, negotiate the terms with the prosecution, wherein we will say that hey, my client has done eight years of community work. Uh, there is a restitution. We pay like the we we pay the what what for example if if they did the shopping for a particular store you know, for a particular store, right? We repay that money to that store so that there is restitution of any damages, right? And then we'll say that it's a first time offense. I ask the judge to make it a nono process. Nono process is something that means that the, the um, government is no longer it is not prosecuting that case. So that when in, on the record, it doesn't say that uh, the, the case has been suspended or dismissed for this reason. Okay. okay. And also we will try to get the, for example, if a person is charged with a grand larceny, Right, and then we try to get it like the charge down to a petty larceny or something less than that, which uh, which we can use it as a petty offense exception. Okay, so especially if somebody has to go for visa stamping, we need to make sure uh, that they qualify for a petty offense exception. In that way, it will not affect their chance of getting a visa. So we right. have had situations where it. Somebody went for stabbing and the stabbing was denied because they had they were previously charged with a crime. So we had to write letters to the embassy stating that they qualify for this exception. Right? Also, in certain situations, if a person has a US citizen child or a, um, a spouse, right, then also there are certain waivers available. They're depending on the situation. We could go for either a 209C waiver or 212H waiver. The different waivers available depending on the person's status and the crime that they have been charged with. Got it. Uh, now, uh, yeah. Please There's continue. There's a situation please continue. wherein you don't get any waiver. So you have to be very careful with that one. So please don't depend upon these waivers. I highly recommend that you do not get involved in any of these activities because in the recent past, uh, we have seen a lot of students getting involved in um, um, activities involving um, prostitution, right? Uh, this is something that has been in a uh, rise in the last one year right? because we've been seeing a lot of cases on that one. So please be very careful with the, with uh, uh, with these because there's a lot of entrapment. Like, so typically what happens is it's the police officers who try to chat with you and then um, uh, and, uh, there's, that's called entrapment. So basically they will make you uh, to, uh, to ask for certain sexual favors, right? So you have to be very careful with these. Yes. Yes. Uh, and also, Reddy Garu, uh, let's talk about the different consequences and the differences between uh, the consequences that people might have on an immigrant and a non-immigrant visa. Are the consequences different from each other or uh, uh, will the people face the same uh, charges for the crime that have, they will be doing? So non-immigrants could be charged if they are charged with offenses that make them inadmissible, right? So if, if they're charged with a crime that makes them inadmissible, then they will have issues entering into the country and also issues adjusting their status. Okay. The requirement for inadmissibility is smaller compared to being removed or deported from the country. So 
if a person is charged with a crime that is that makes him inadmissible right then the person will not like if they leave the country they cannot enter back and they cannot uh, apply for adjustment of status whereas if the same person if he is charged with a crime that makes him deportable or removed removable from the country then what happens is typically soon after the uh, sentencing is done the ice officials are going to arrest the person from the court and then they put them through the deportation and the moral uh, proceedings sometimes we have seen uh, the the refugees are officials coming after years after the person has been charged with such offenses okay so depending on the manpower it could happen immediately or it could happen after some time yeah. also if a person is already a green card holder then they have certain uh, other more exceptions so for example if a person is charged with a crime involving murder or shoplifting right and if they are trying to apply for citizenship right so then what we try to do is we look at the timing of, as to when that issue happened when that uh, crime happened did it happen in the last 5 years um, from the day the person has was admitted into the country okay then we look at whether the maximum sentence for that crime is more than 1 year or not okay then we also look at like for example uh, we also look at whether the person has been charged with more than two crimes involving moral turpitude unless it throws out of the same consequences or same facts so there are different things that we have to look at and it's i know it's a little tough to explain uh, on this call but it's all rule based okay so depending on the person's current immigration status and the crimes that the person has been charged we have to decide on what is the best option available for them okay so typically when we are negotiating like when we are handling the criminal case itself we look at all of these to make sure that the person's immigration they they have minimal effect on the person's immigration status yeah so uh, ready garu uh, we did have a discussion on call that we would be talking more on uh, the domestic violence but before we get on to that can you give um, you know like an in basic introduction about it and also um, i think this uh, that's uh, the, uh, the most common thing like me being in this uh, you know on media and the most common thing that i've heard was the abuse that uh, you know uh, that has been give, that th- that uh, the dependents who are are on you know their dependent visa they get and unfortunately most of them not all of them but some of them are uneducated and they really don't know how to get their help so what kind of consequences can you know people who abuse their dependents or anybody domestically can be under uh, you know uh, you know under the court what are your thing uh, what is your take on this so whenever any domestic whenever there is an um, issue of any domestic violence i highly recommend that person to reach out to their lot of non profit organizations everywhere in the country you see lot of non profit organizations which uh, support victims of domestic violence okay they have to reach out to them they have to reach out to uh, the local bar association because the local bar associations also provide free attorneys free of charge for victims of domestic violence as long as you can prove that you don't have your don't have so much income and all that stuff so this domestic violence cases typically involve when a person um uh, um um what is um, a person has either like physical violence or it could be sexual violence what different kinds of violence against and the spouse or the children okay so this can be categorized as a crime involving moral turpitude also in depending on the situation so and depending on the uh, the um uh, aggressiveness of the crime the person could be charged with either um a misdemeanor or a felony okay misdemeanor is a crime which carries less than 1 year of sentence but whenever Uh, if, if it's an aggravated assault the person the person could be charged with a felony um and the um jail sentence could be more than 1 year 
okay so in those situations a person could actually be put through deportation if he's charged with uh, aggravated assault or aggravated felony got it okay got it. so typically what happens is most of these domestic violence cases these are not like intentional uh, because i would say this one like 90% 90 to 95% of the times when we see a domestic violence case it's it, it might have just happened like oh, it's a it, it's it's a one time event and maybe something went wrong between the husband and wife they had a quarrel and then uh, one of the um, spouses hit the other spouse right it's not like they do not intend to live together or it's not like they are dangerous to each other it's just that maybe it's a one time event that happened okay so in those cases what we do is we work with the prosecution we work with the court so, and then extend them that it's the first time offense okay and then they'll have to go through the aggress the, the aggressor who were the aggressor spouse they will have to go through certain uh, uh, training programs and some certain rehabilitation programs uh, to make sure that the person does not repeat such behavior okay but if 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 this happens on a regular basis then the person could be in big trouble got it got it and i okay. think and also yeah. they look at other things whether the person was in, in under, under the influence of alcohol or drugs or um, um, the um, uh, in the extent of the injury that the victim has suffered right they look at all of these things in coming up with a uh, with the charge okay and depending on the charge the person could be uh, have different conviction and Uh, which could have an effect on their immigration status too yeah great uh i think with that ready garo we can uh, wrap up today's show and maybe in the next episode like to discuss we'll discuss more in deep depth about uh the domestic violence and the complications and consequences that people can face so i think with that let's end this session thank you so much ready garo for tuning in it is lovely having you on our show thank you for the viewers for tuning in you're watching sachi tv with me shivani raj Thank you.